Thank you. I don't think this lectern is designed for short people, so I hope you can see me. Um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to join the forum. I'm really, really excited to be here. I um, want to say particular thanks to Professor Raj and Professor Roy for, for inviting me. Um, I'll start off by just saying a little bit about Nesta because I expect most of you won't know who we are. Um, so we're an innovation foundation. We were set up um, about 16 years ago with an endowment originally from the UK's National Lottery and our mission is to back new ideas to tackle the big challenges of our time. And um, we're a charity, we're fully independent and we're based in the UK but increasingly we work all over the world. And my work is particularly focused on inclusive innovation. I'm head of inclusive innovation at Nesta. I work in our policy and research team. And my um, projects really focus on new models and approaches to, to innovating and supporting innovation and how they can be applied. So recently I've been working in Brazil with the state government of Sao Paulo looking at open innovation methods and their application in health innovation. Um, and I've also done some research in India looking at um, innovate, uh, innovation accelerators and incubators and how they can better support social enterprises. And just, I'm just going to talk very briefly about some of the work we've been doing, which I think is relevant to our discussions about inclusive manufacturing. And I'm going to be drawing on some of the work that Nesta's done in social innovation, and in particular, uh, the use of digital technologies in social innovation. So we call it digital social innovation, but others might use terms like civic technology or tech for good. Um, we've done quite a lot of research also on the maker movement, which I think is relevant to these discussions and we haven't ha heard so much about yet. Um, so just to start off with one, um, one reflection on what we think at Nesta Inclusive Innovation means, and I think this really reflects some of the comments that were made earlier, particularly by one of the questions at the end of the last session. So we really see it as having two faces. So on the one hand, inclusive innovation is about inclusive processes, so involving a much wider range of people and organisation organisations in innovation processes, right from identifying problems that need to be solved to ideation and invention to making um, to entrepre entrepreneurship and so on. And obviously that includes concepts like user innovation, inclusive supply chains, and makers, and some of the other things we've heard about today. The other side of inclusive innovation is around inclusive outcomes, so the, the product of innovation, whether it's a good or a service or, or some sort of solution, um, is, is aimed at people whose, whose needs are being poorly met or maybe not met at all. And one dimension of that is affordability, which obviously we've heard a lot about already. So making products and services available to people who otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford them. And that has the aspect of mass innovation that um, Professor Rajkumar spoke about earlier. But I think also important to recognise is the element around um, meeting the needs of niche groups of users whose needs might not be met because there's only a small number of them, but they need something quite specific. So the elements of customization that we heard from um, Prof um, Professor Gupta come up here as well. So with those two things in mind, I just wanted to offer um, three reflections on if we're thinking about what could inclusive manufacturing mean in the future, and we want to build an inclusive manufacturing initiative, some, some additional things to the frameworks that we've heard already that might be relevant. So the first one is about resources and assets. Um, what resources and assets do we have, do we need, and can we make available to support inclusive manufacturing? Um, and uh, I, I think three things that we've not heard so much about yet today include um, open design, actually this was in the last talk, open design and open hardware. Um, physical spaces to make stuff, whether that's maker spaces or fab labs or micro factories. Um, and also communities, so communities of interest. And I'll illustrate this by the example of um, this organisation, it's called Disrupt Disability. Um, they are putting together a library of open source designs um, for dis disabled people to make their own wheelchairs. So this is a very early stage initiative. It's um, kicked off in London last year with a few hackathons with um, wheelchair users, um, software designers, makers, um, uh, designers. Um, and they're, yeah, they're looking to make, um, make available, open, free um, designs so that anywhere, anyone anywhere in the world can, can um, print, basically 3D print their own wheelchairs or components of wheelchairs so they can customise wheelchairs to their own use. And they believe that um, to make this successful, um, open design and access to open hardware are absolutely fundamental. Um, but also um, maker spaces are really important. So Disrupt Disability is based at a maker space in London called Mach Machines, um, um, the Machines um, Engine, sorry, Machines Room. So they have the benefit of having um, access to a lot of digital fabrication machines. 
Um, and also, to make this initiative successful, it needs to tap into a large community of interest that might actually be globally distributed. So people who are wheelchair users themselves, who work with wheelchair users, who have the skills to design um, components or parts of wheelchairs or whole wheel wheelchairs and can contribute to this open library. Um, one other um, reflection on what might be needed is around materials. And we've, we've heard a bit about um, recycling, reusing components. Um, I, I wanted to just draw your attention to this initiative, which I think is really exciting. Again, it's quite early stage. So it's called Precious Plastic, and it comes from the Netherlands. Um, this organization has created open blueprints for these four machines. And they're very simple. The idea is that they can be made by anyone, anywhere, without too much um, specialized knowledge or, or tools. Um, as well as the blueprints, they have a lot of instructional videos online. Um, and what the aim of these is to make it possible for anyone to set up their own mini plastic recycling plant. So the founder, who's a design student, noticed that plastic, you know, it's huge amounts of waste plastic around the world. I think only 10% of plastic is recycled at the moment. Um, and it's only possible really to recycle plastic if you're, one, as he says, one of the big boys, so you've got a big um, plant um, to do it. And, and so these machines uh, aim at making it possible for anyone to do it. They, one of them's a shredder, it kind of um, shreds up plastic into, into small pieces, there's something that melts the plastic, and um, you can then remould it and remake it into all different types of products. Um, and again, this is all these designs are available for free. Um, I think at last count there were 100 of these little plants around the world, but the creator really wants it to become a, a huge global movement. So going back to the last slide where I mentioned communities of interest, again, communities are really important to making this work. You know, how do we get this idea out there and get other people interested and excited about taking part? And sort of build, build a movement really around it. And, and the third point I wanted to raise, which I don't think we have heard much about yet today, was about policy. And we might need to influence policymakers or at least explore how policy can support um, op uh, distributed and open um, and inclusive manufacturing. Um, so this is another example called WikiHouse. Um, WikiHouse is a collaboration of architects, um, designers and makers. Um, and they want to open up house building to citizens, so they talk about unlocking the citizen sector in house building. Um, it's UK based, but again it works in different countries, but in the, in the UK, um, those of you who are from the UK know that we have quite um, a shortage of housing. Housing is very, very expensive. Um, and one way to tackle that is to, to, to reduce the cost of house building through open source um, house design. Um, but at the moment, it's very difficult to make this work in practice because of the way that um, local planning authorities operate. So, for example, those who have, resp uh, have uh, responsibility for decide deciding whether a house building project can go ahead um, are used to working with big developers. They're not set up to work with individuals who want to build their own houses, and they don't really just support this type of making. So if this is going to become, uh, you know, to really achieve its potential to reduce the cost of housing and, and, and reach scale, it needs policy support. And obviously this is very contextually specific to house building and house building in the UK, but I'm sure as we talk about the, um, the, the more detailed opportunities um, for inclusive manufacturing here in India and, and further, further afield, there'll be policy implications as well that we need to consider. Um, so one, one final reflection, which is more about a challenge. So I've talked a little bit about distributed manufacturing and some, some early stage experiments in distributed manufacturing in the UK and, and Europe. And, and the objectives of all of those three innovate, innovations, these social entrepreneurs that I've described, that they all have a, vi a vision of making things open source, accessible, affordable, um, customizable, um, uh, available to all. But at the moment, um, Making as a, as a sort of um, sort of global phenomenon is it's not that inclusive. It, the maker community is still quite niche, quite narrow. Um, we've done some research on maker spaces in the UK and also in China, and most of the people who, who use them are mostly men. They're mostly um, from a software and technology background. They're mostly highly educated, and they're predominantly urban. So in the UK, there's actually now around 100 maker spaces. Most cities have one, some have two. London has the most, as you can imagine. So the most potential for scaling up inclusive manufacturing is actually in London. 
Um, and that might be the place where we need it the least. So I think a big challenge for us as we're thinking about how we would design an inclusive manufacturing initiative going forward is how would we make it really, really inclusive and, and in particular um, focused in, in rural areas. I think that is quite, quite, a, quite a big challenge. Um, so final reflections. Um, as I said, I'm really, really pleased to be here because I think this is a very timely discussion to be had. Um, discussions around inclusive economic growth, um, a rising the agenda around the world, even in the UK where we haven't had much talk about that. Our new Prime Minister has been talking about making an economy that works for all, so that's encouraging. Um, I think this is also groundbreaking. I think as a speaker said earlier, um, you know, we, 20 years ago people, not me, <laughs> but the other people were able to um, envision a, man, a manufacturing um, that's much more decentralised and distributed, but it's only recently become possible through, through the use of new technologies. And most experiments that I know of at least are at a very, very early stage. So this is really exciting um, time to be discussing inclusive manufacturing and thinking about how it might go forward. As Professor Roy said right at the start, this really is internationally relevant and certainly from a UK perspective we'd love to explore international collaboration as you're thinking about how to take this forward. Um, but finally, yes, it is quite difficult. I think if we do want to bring together those two halves of inclusive innovation, so inclusive processes and inclusive outcomes, distribute, uh, inclusive manufacturing is a really good opportunity to do that, but to make it, to make it really have those, those joint benefits, I think, will be tricky. So um, my, my thoughts on how to do that are really reflecting, um, I think, Professor Chakrabarti's points earlier around the use of design. And I think we should be thinking about um, how, to, how we can start small, how we can be very human-centred, how we can prototype, test, iterate, fail fast, and so on, and learn from our experiences as we're designing this type of initiative to take forward. Thank you very much.